Hello everyone and welcome back to this third video in this series where we're looking at the vCenter Virtual Appliance Server and we're also looking at the vSphere Web Client. Now we have everything set up so it's time to actually start bringing in some hosts and creating some things inside our vSphere Web Client. As I said before, I want to try to show how to do everything with inside the vSphere Web Client so this is where we're going to be starting. As you can see we have this, this home page where we see a getting started area and you're going to kind of see that in a few different objects where you have a getting started tab but really I've kind of started removing those because I want to get you familiar with actually looking around and figuring out how to actually add things in without having to always use the get starting tab because it's a, it's a way for really helping you explore so let's go ahead let's navigate over to our vCenter instance and as you can see we already have a vCenter server installed this is vCenter 5195 and right here it's going to tell you let's go create a data center at a host but let's not really do that let's think about really what we can do to help you know other ways where we can start maybe creating the data center next right maybe I can figure out if it's maybe under the actions tab right well here it is so I can go under actions create a new data center create new folders but maybe I don't want to go there maybe I want to do it over here underneath the data centers tab and of course this is where I can do it as well as you can see I have this new object right here where I can create a new data center so let's go ahead and let's do that and I'm gonna call this Louisville because that's where I live I'm gonna make sure it's getting placed under the vCenter system 5195 we'll click OK as you can see over here it's actually creating the data center don't mind these other objects or recent tasks over here because this is stuff I was missing with earlier but as soon as we created that data center look what's available to us now we can add a host we can add clusters add data stores VMs networking well you can't really add a VM right now because there's really nowhere to place it on a host so I guess that's really the next step is we need to start adding some hosts into it so of course we can add it through here we can add through this button uh, we can go back and we can do it at the vCenter level view, right? We can go and, or actually can we? No, we can't actually add it through here. So let's go ahead and we'll go back. And like I said, I want to start dealing with some more different views. So can you do it under maybe this view right here where we're looking at uh, the more of a tree view? And of course, yes, you have this add a host or add new data center, or add a folder. You have a lot more things right here in this top level objects button where we can start getting into this. Maybe we can look at the host section. Of course, you can start dealing with this when we look in that button. Uh, of course, you always have this getting started tab where you can start going through here. But as we talked about before, let's start looking in this host view because we're starting to get a, get a way to start figuring out how we want to start looking at and managing. And it's, as you can tell, I'm not too sure if I pointed this out before, is you have this sort of way around here is where you have this I guess you could say a category view and underneath of it is where you start looking at the defined objects. So let's go ahead and we will add a host. I've got two ESXi hosts that I've already created. I didn't show you actually how to do the installation of ESXi. It's actually very simple. It's something that if you're watching this you should already know how to do anyway. If you've done it in 4.0, 4.1, 5.0, update 1, it's all it all looks the same. So let's go ahead and we'll click next. And of course, it's just going to ask for our credentials as we're all used to doing in the old C Sharp client. Go ahead and click Next again. And it's going to ask for uh, to pretty much say, do you want to go ahead and authenticate, authenticate against this sash? So we'll say yes. And we're going to click Next, Next, Next. We don't need to worry about assigning a license yet. We can do that at some other point. We don't need to enable lockdown mode because we still want to be able to access the DCUI. If it has VMs already running, this is where you would choose about where to run the VMs. Don't really have any, so we're going to go ahead and we'll click Next. We'll click Finish. And as you can see, it's adding the standalone host into here. It's about 80% done. In a second, it should say Connected. And now we have it connected. So I'm going to go ahead and I will start adding in my second host into here. I will pause it and I will come back in just a second. Now that I have both my hosts added, I think I should probably point out one cool thing about the new interface right here. And it's a lot different than what we're used to in the old interface. And really, this is kind of something that if you've ever messed with uh, Power, Power GUI, Power GUI, and messing with Power CLI for vSphere, you might be sort of, I guess you can understand this, but since we have two objects right here, when we start looking at building virtual machines and everything like that, you're going to see that when you have this sort of categorized view up here, you can actually select multiple hosts at a single time and perform actions against all of them, right? So if I wanted to, say, 
put both of these hosts in maintenance mode, I could go ahead and I could do that and it's going to say do you want to perform it on all two objects. So it's an easy way to do mass administration whereas in the old views your client we couldn't really do that. But I think next let's go ahead and let's start configuring our host. So let's go ahead and we will click on this host right here. So you can click on an underneath here underneath this sort of objects view tab or if you go back up to the I guess you could say the categorize view, view tab you can actually just click on the host right here it basically creates a link into it and as you can see it also gives you a bunch of information on the counts of what's on it uptime everything like that so you can actually click it from there too and it'll it'll basically link you to where you need to go now and underneath here we're looking at a summary of what our host has into it right it says what kind of CPU you actually drill down even further into it. You can see cores, logical processors. Um, of course, this is a nested ESXi image, so it, you know you're getting a lot of you know stuff that might might not be it might be a little bit fake, I guess you could say. Um, but there's there is a way to kind of just look through and kind of see what this host does have to offer. We're going to skip over the monitor tab and really just jump over to manage because monitor is really where we're going to just see a bunch of stuff about logging. Um, maybe it's alarm stuff like that but we really want to focus on the managed portion of this one because we want to look at sort of what everything we would see inside the vSphere client and how it might look a little bit different of course if we go under the VM portion we're going to see default VM compatibility this is something where maybe you don't you haven't seen this before but you can actually set the compatibility of what kind of host or what kind of guest VM sorry what kind of guest VMs and what hardware version it can actually run um, it's best to leave this as compatible with the data center setting and the host version uh, because it's, it's something that's going to make it a lot easier going down the road if you had to troubleshoot. Of course, VM startup and shutdown if you need to make sure about changing anything. Of course, we don't have any VMs really set yet, so we can't really change anything. If we go down to licensing, this is where you can assign a license key. Basically, you would go underneath here and you can actually choose something from an existing license key or we can actually assign a new one. When you assign a new one, you decode it and you click OK, it's actually going to go ahead and add that to the inventory of all your licenses. Since we aren't using host profiles, we'll skip that portion and we'll really look at the time configuration because this is something that you always need to set within your ESX host. If you ever forget about it, this is something that uh, is very it's very crucial, so I would always encourage you to do it. And it's actually a simple thing. If you need to add it for, a, say, a local server on your own network, well, if I can type it right, we have that, or you can actually use the vmwarepool.ntp.org NTP servers as well. So this is something that you can use, and you can press OK uh, to actually save those settings, and then we can go back in. Let's let it go ahead, and it'll save the NTP servers underneath there, and then we'll go back in and actually restart the client. Now that it updated the configuration, we can see that the NTP client's already enabled, but the NTP service is stopped. So let's go ahead and we'll go back in and we will actually start the NTP service. Now that our service is up and running, we'll click OK. And we can say that it's enabled and it's up and running. We can look down at authentication services. I personally always like to keep local authentication. Um, if you want to join it to a domain, you can do that as well. I, I just tend to not do that just because it has been buggy in the past uh, to be able to do that. Plus, I, I like knowing that um, if AD's down for whatever reason, if there's a complete meltdown, um, I don't have to worry about AD credentials or anything like that. So keeping local domain or local authentication has always been something that I personally have always done. If you plan on using DPM, of course, you can go to the power management settings, put in your IPMI, IPMI or ILL settings for power management. You can also go down here to advanced system settings. And this is something that's not as clean as I think it was in the, in the C-sharp client, right, where it, you had different categories, and on the right-hand side, you could see exactly what it was. This is basically just a, a massive list of stuff, so really, you have to start filtering out. So we'll say we want to look at NFS. Uh, because there's always a bunch of NFS stuff that you want to change uh, when you configure this, such as you want to you want to change the heartbeat max failures. Um, I'd have to look and remember everything because I can't remember it all. But you know, there's there's definitely uh, some things that you always want to change on here. For instance, we'll say one thing you want to change is this NFS max volumes because really sometimes you might need more than 
eight actual data stores for NFS. So let's go ahead, we'll click this button right here to edit, and we'll change this to, we'll say 64. Click OK. It's updating the option values, as you can see in the recent tasks. And it's now been changed over here. So it's a pretty easy way to actually go through and change some stuff. If we look down in the system resource allocation tab, this is basically what you're being able to reserve for the actual hypervisor itself. So if you want to reserve more megahertz or more, more gigs of RAM, it's up to you. Um, it's probably best to always leave this by default just because it's not recommended to change. If you want to look at the firewall, of course, you just go to the security profile and you can actually see everything that's underneath here. You can see what kind of services. So if you want to maybe go ahead and start the, SS, the SSH service, as simple as going in here, you can start and stop it manually. So we can say that it's running now. We can click OK. And we can go back up if you ever want to poke more holes in the firewall. It's very easy to do by going here to edit. And you can actually put in anything that you want. So it's an actually easy way to just add firewall rules. Uh, if you want to go to system swap, of course, this is if you want to use host cache. Um, depending on this is something that is done for VDI purposes by using host cache. Usually you need an SSD or some sort of drive within the host itself. but uh, depends on your own, your own environment. And lastly, you kind of just look at the hardware. You kind of see what's running inside the host itself. This is kind of the same stuff you're going to see on that summary tab. So you might really not get a lot of stuff out of it. But that's all we're looking at right now in the settings. When we come back, we will be looking at creating distributed switches, adding port groups, creating VMK NICs. And from there, we will add storage and from there on, we'll keep going. So thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.